one. Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, my goodness. It's such a wonderful winter's day. I hope you're enjoying it as well. And I'm all bundled up, so I'm pretty cozy. <laughs> um, welcome to our Winter Birding Nature in Your Classroom live stream. My name is Raya, for those who haven't uh, met me before or seen me before. And I work for an organization called TRCA. And I'll show you our logo here. Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And so Toronto and Region means that um, organization does a lot of work in kind of the GTA generally. Um, and conservation, think about the word conserve, means like to save, protect. So our, what we're really trying to do is ensure that we are conserving the environment as an organization and working with others so that we're all in, in it together basically. So we have um, today on our live stream some folks on the back end helping in the chat. And we've also got Jasmine who's doing tech. So Jasmine, come on and say hi. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, we'll see Jasmine a lot more later on. And um, if you have any questions during the live stream, you can absolutely put them in the chat. Please remember that we wanna keep the chat respectful. So if you're a teacher and you're putting your students questions, that's great. If you are a student who has direct access to the chat, just, um, just make sure that you're putting like respectful um, comments in the chat, okay? We love questions. We are going to have a Q&A, question and answer period at the very end, um, but we also can answer some of the questions in the chat during the live stream. So we'll kind of see how that goes. But don't worry if you're asking right now and then <laughs> we might get to it at the end. Also, if you happen to have a worksheet and Jasmine's gonna pull up what that looks like right now, um, then you can follow along and uh, see what you can answer in the worksheet based on what we talk about in the live stream. If you don't have a worksheet, no problem, you don't need it. It's just kind of to um, uh, help you kind of quiz yourself and challenge yourself on what you're picking up. The worksheet link um, in order to request one is in the description of this video and also in the chat at this point. So what are we doing today? Well, we are going to be learning about different bird species. We are going to be exploring some of the bird, um, birds connections with their ecological communities. So ecosystems, right? What are those interactions that they have with ecosystems? We're gonna be learning about how we can get involved in outdoor learning when it comes to birds. And I wanna show you our setup. So I'm just gonna come around the phone here and show you what we've got going. So if you look over here, um, if you look over right over there, you can see that there's a feeder out there and that feeder is too far away for, you can see somebody flying to it, but we can't really see details. So we have what's called a birding scope. So this is a scope here and it has a device on it that then takes what the scope is seeing and brings that information over <laughs> to an iPad. And the iPad, now you're seeing on the right hand side, there's the feeder cam. We're seeing what is on the iPad. So if we wait long enough and I stop talking for a moment, we might see a bird flying in. There are some birds that come by quickly. Oh, there's one. And they'll grab a seed and then they'll leave really fast and hide that seed. Maybe you have an idea of who that bird is. We'll talk about that further in a moment. Oh my gosh, so cool. Okay, so that is our setup and we'll be coming back and forth to our feeder cam throughout the live stream. So let's talk birds and I just need to, there we are, orient the, uh, the screen properly. I'm using a stabilization device for the videos for my phone. And so sometimes it has a mind of its own. We'll do our best. Now, when it comes to what birds I wanted to share with you today in terms of like learning about different winter bird species, I had a really hard time choosing. There are so many different types of birds out there that are specific to this area in the winter or that stick around in the winter. A lot of them migrate south, right, for the winter. But there are so many different birds. I kind of tried to narrow it down. Um, in real life, I could spend like a two hour in-person nature walk where I'm only talking about winter waterfowl. Well, and I'll share who, who winter waterfowl are a little bit later today. Um, these are aquatic or birds who like to spend time, need to spend time in lakes and other aquatic spaces. Well, today I wanted to focus more on the inland bird species. I think of them as like terrestrial birds. Think about Terra, that means earth, right? 
So birds that are on land, as opposed to aquatic or water um, birds that like water habitats. So these land birds, terrestrial birds, they um, are ones that even if you don't live near a body of water, you might still come across them in the winter. Let's get right to it. Oh, actually, I wanted to share one more thing. So some of you might have learned about the scientific classification system, right? Um, starting with kingdom, phylum, and going down. Well, I just wanted to have you kind of think back to that concept because when we're talking about birds, we're talking about organisms that are all in the same class, the class of aves, A-V-E-S. So they're all in the same class. But within the class of aves, there are 41 different orders of birds. And so we're gonna be talking about some birds in different orders. Down from orders, you've got family, and then they might divide the genus and species. We'll pretty much focus on the species level. I just wanted to kind of take this out to a bigger context. Okay, so let's get to our first bird. So we're seeing a picture right now of a bird. This is the one we saw at the feeder as well. And if you know the name of this bird, you can call it out even if nobody's listening, just for fun. Or you can write it in the chat if you like. And this bird is, oh, I think it's in the picture actually, isn't it the name of the bird? <laughs> so this is a black cap chickadee. And black cap chickadees are, um, they're birds that stick around in the winter because they have adapted to, to the cold weather and how to find food in the winter. Finding food is a reason that a lot of birds migrate south, right? So chickadees have figured this out. Now I wanted to share um, some sounds that different birds make. So I'm a little bit, you might think I'm a little bit distracted right now. I'm just going to my other device to share some bird sounds. And I wanted to share the chickadee sound or one of them. Birds have songs and calls. So I'm gonna share with you for the chickadee, one song and one call. Here is one of the chickadee songs. Have you heard this before? They kind of sound like they're going, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. And by the way, I know it sounds loud in your phone. It's not too loud out here. I never really want to play very loud bird sounds where other birds might be listening because it's confusing for them. So that hey, sweetie sound that chickadees use or, or make, the song, is to attract other chickadees near them. And kind of, it's a very friendly sound for other chickadees. Now, you might be more familiar with a different chickadee sound that sounds like this. <laughs> That's that typical kind of chickadee dee 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 dee, chickadee dee dee. And what's really cool about the chickadee dee sound that birds make is that, that chickadees make, is that it can be kind of a social sound if there are maybe two or three or four or even maybe five Ds. But if you're hearing a chickadee going chickadee dee 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 dee, and they have a lot of Ds, like more than five or six, that they're actually, it's an alarm call. They're actually announcing to other chickadees that there's danger around, some kind of a threat. So even if it's the same call, a variation in how they make the call can make a big difference. So that was our chickadee with a little black cap. Um, we, there are also boreal chickadees in Canada and the black cap chickadee is the one that we see here for the most part. So um, next bird, the next bird is a bird that there are, two, so it's a nuthatch. We have two types of nuthatches in this area. Some are red-breasted nuthatches, and then the one you're seeing here is the white-breasted nuthatch. And looking at this picture, do you notice anything a little bit unusual about the white-breasted nuthatch? Which direction is it facing? When I picture a bird, I usually picture them, if they're on a tree, that their head is up. Well, in this case, the nuthatch, they usually like to have their head down. And hopefully we'll see one on a feeder at some point. Jasmine, you're welcome to jump right nope, <laughs> to it if you see it. One just flew away, bad timing, Raya. Um, but if you see a bird on a tree or a branch or on a ledge or something, and it's kind of oriented down with its head down, that is probably a nuthatch. And then you just have to figure out, okay, is it red-breasted or white-breasted? The red-breasted nuthatch has a bit of a reddish color on its front. And, um, it's a bit smaller. The white-breasted has a clearly white belly, but they look pretty similar to chickadees. So um, some people look at it first and say, oh, that's a chicken, that's a nuthatch. Now, the next one that we've got is another black and white bird. These first three are all kind of black, white, gray. This is one of the most darling birds, I think. When I see them, 
in usually it's like end of November when I start seeing them, have these dark eyed juncos, and I'm like, oh, they're back for the winter. Yay! Dark eyed juncos are quite small. They're dark on the back. Their eye sort of blends into the color on the side of their face. They're white in the belly. And they're often on the ground. You'll see them in other places too, but I often see them on the ground. Now, when I first learned about them, the trick that somebody told me to be like, if you see this happen, that's a dark eye junco, is that when they take off, when they fly off, their the feathers underneath their um, tail, their dark tail, are actually white. So when they fly off, there's a little flash of white as their tail fans out and you see these uh, white under feathers. Super cool. So that's the dark eye junco. I keep looking over to the feeder just to have a quick look, but I think because I'm speaking a little bit loudly, they're all like, yeah, we're, we're gonna stay far away. We'll see them later on when I move. Um, next one. And here I'm gonna play the sound again. So this bird is one that when people see it, they, it's a real uh, eye catcher. A real, grabs a lot of attention, right? This bright bird, beautiful Northern Cardinal. And the one we have in the picture is a male. Female Northern Cardinals are actually more brown. They still have that orange or red beak, um, but same body shape. They have the crest on the top of their head. So you'll notice I'm mentioning some ID features here, right? The cap or the crest and um, the beak, looking at body shape, things like this. So these are all features as you're learning about birds that you can keep your eyes open for. So the cardinal, I often hear them instead of see them, even though they're bright red. In my life, I have heard way more cardinal, cardinals than I've seen. I'll hear them and I, for some reason, can't find them. But the sound is really distinct. Um, they have a few different variations on their sounds. Some people hear kind of a birdie, 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 birdie. Um, I usually think of it, part of their sound sounds to me like, like pew, 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 pew. <laughs> so it kind of depends on what part of the song you're hearing. But let's play one that has some different variation in it. One more time. You hear that? Pew, pew. Um, so that sound can be really striking and then you look around you're like where's the cardinal or maybe you find it and that's cool too next bird so this one I'm going to ask you have you seen this bird before maybe some of you are thinking nope never seen that bird maybe some of you are like oh yeah I see it all the time if you said no what probably happened is that you've seen it but you haven't really noticed it these birds are all across the GTA. I see them every single day. So um, in the birding world, people say a little brown jog, LBJ. <laughs> They'll often see a bird and if they don't know what it is, oh, it's an LBJ, a little brown jog. So you might call this a little brown jog. But if you look more closely, this little brown bird um, has a black patch right in front of its chest there. And they've got a little bit of uh, different coloring. If you start looking at the brown pattern on their back, you can notice these patterns. Of bird. So the house sparrow, it's originally a bird from Europe. It's not actually from Canada originally. The house sparrow is a bird that has adapted so well to urban settings, to cities, that there are a lot of them. Look outside your window or next time you go for a walk, try to find a house sparrow and see if you can spot one, if not 20. <laughs> um, so the male bird has that, that splotch there. Now, some people might say, okay, yeah, so that's a sparrow. But there are lots of different types of sparrows. And one sparrow, the house sparrow, we see year round. There's another sparrow who only comes in the winter, and that is the American tree sparrow. So I want you to compare these two. House sparrow on one side, American tree sparrow on the other. They have a similar body shape. You could say they're both little round jobs, but um, look more closely. The American tree sparrow has a little rufous cap, a little gray just above the eye, they have a little eye line. And look at their beak. The American tree sparrow has same shape beak as the house sparrow and other sparrows, but they have black on the upper bill and a yellow lower bill. So that is really distinctive for the American tree sparrow. Again, it's a bird that we only see in the winter. My goodness, you could spend like forever just learning different sparrows, there are so many, but we'll stop there with the sparrows in terms of those two. Now, we're gonna take a little break shortly to look at the feeder again, but I did want to um, talk about woodpeckers for a moment. There are a variety of different woodpeckers in urban spaces and two of them, look really, really similar. These are probably the most common ones that we come across, um, at least I've come across in the GTA. So one of them is a hairy woodpecker, one of them is a downy woodpecker. And 
having a look at them, you might say, Raya, those are the exact same bird. But wait, one has a red spot on its head. My friends, both a hairy and a downy could have a red spot on their head. The red actually means it's the male bird. The female, excuse me, the female woodpecker, female hairy or downy woodpecker doesn't have the red spot. The male has a red spot. Um, a lot of, in the birding world, the male birds often get the more showy feathers. I mentioned the cardinal earlier, bright red, where the female's kind of brown. So she's trying to camouflage so that she doesn't reveal where the eggs are, for instance, on the nest that she's sitting on. Um, and the male birds look all flashy because they're like, hey, we want to make friends. Come on over. Look at me. I'm fancy. Um, <laughs> so in any case, with the woodpecker, that fanciness just lands on a red spot on the head. But let's look at what is different between these two. We've talked about a few different parts of the bird. I want you to focus on the beak. On the downy woodpecker, that beak is quite little, actually. It's like a fraction of the size of a head. Look at the hairy woodpecker's beak. If you took that beak and measured it against the head, it takes up definitely more than half of the head length. So um, this is where you get into some more detailed stuff with these woodpeckers. Downy and hairy woodpeckers, they're hard to tell apart. If you're able to kind of catch a glimpse of that beak and make your assessment that way, then you probably like a, got a good, uh, good assessment there. <laughs> you figured out who it is. So I'm gonna we're going to play a video, and I want you to think about um, which woodpecker is this? Is it a hairy or a downy? I'm gonna come off screen for it. Let's look at the video. Right, I'm just gonna interrupt you for a second. We have a cardinal at the feed feeder. Super exciting. Thank you, oh my goodness. That's excellent. So we talked about the cardinal earlier. You can see the crest. You can see the black around the beak, perhaps. Showstopper, right? What do we say? <laughs> Oh, so beautiful. Oh, I thought I saw another one coming on one side. I'm not sure if it made it to the camera. Okay, so um, if we can have that video come up, Jasmine, we have got a video of a woodpecker and I want you to decide, is it a hairy or a downy? Focus on the beak. What do you think? Hairy or a downy woodpecker? Put it in the chat. Oh, and it's flying away. See that? Sometimes you just get these little glimpses. Oh, another one. <laughs> so this is a red-bellied woodpecker that just came in. And they're selecting some seed as well. Some people say, why wouldn't it be called a red-headed woodpecker? Well, there's actually another woodpecker that has an entirely red head. And so this one with a little tiny bit of red on its belly is called the red-bellied woodpecker. And oh, little cameo from a chickadee. Those guys come and go really quick. All right, so who said hairy and who said downy? Jasmine, did we have any come up in the chat at this point? I am seeing a lot of people in the chat who are saying that it is a hairy woodpecker. <laughs> Love it. Good job, everybody. Totally. It's a hairy, that was a hairy woodpecker in the video. Really a solid beak. I also find when I see them on trees sometimes that the downy woodpeckers are a little more gentle. And the hairy woodpeckers are like, heck, 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 just flicking things everywhere. Um, so good job, everybody. Excellent. Um, Brian, it looks like the cardinal's back. Do you want to take another peek at it? Let's have a look at the feeder. That cardinal is, uh, you can see that they're eating and then they're taking more and they're eating and they're taking more. Whereas the chickadees that we've been seeing on this feeder today, they fly in they grab a seed and then they go fly in, grab a seed and oh, and they go because the chickadees are actually hiding these seeds. Oh my gosh. Oh, we just saw this one really briefly in our video. Who is this? Do you remember what I said? And they flew off. <laughs> so that was the red bellied woodpecker. All right. So these chickadees, I just have to share this because it like it blew me away when I read an article on this. Um, their brain in the winter, it actually, they're memorizing where they're hiding all these seeds. And so their brain physically gets larger. There have been studies done. Their brain grows as they're memorizing all these different caches where they hide the seeds. So they go back and forth, grab a seed and go, grab a seed and go. What a great, amazing adaptation. So cool. All right. If that red belly comes back, Jasmine, interrupt me. Love to see that for longer. Um, so 
there are three more birds I want to share about, and then we're going to go for a walkabout and check out some of these interactions with the ecosystem that bird, birds have. Now, one of these, um, actually the first one, is a bird that's pretty common in urban spaces. This is a crow, the American crow. And the American crow, um, I want all of us to get into this. So we've been hearing some bird sounds. I want you to start making some bird sounds. So I want everybody to give me your best caw, caw, caw. One, two, three. Caw, caw, caw. It's actually kind of fun. <laughs> you might be irritating your parents if they're like listening to you, but tell them it was all in the name of science. Um, so crows, they have a really scratchy caw sound. I'm gonna play an actual crow sound here. So it's like this kind of scratchy sound. There's a bird that looks a lot like a crow. They're usually not as much in urban spaces, but every once in a while they'll, they'll make a nest and start living in a, in a city space. And there, so this is a raven. And I'm gonna play the raven sound. You hear the difference? It's kind of like a gurgling croak. Instead of a ka ka, it's more like a right? So if you're not sure if a bird is a crow or a raven, I mean, you can look at it and make a bit of a comparison. The like, raven has a chunkier kind of head and a like, chunkier beak. Um, they're bigger. I find that's difficult if the bird's flying overhead. But from, if you hear them make their sound, then you can start to differentiate. So that's the crow and raven. The next bird is another one I'm going to ask. Have you seen this bird? The European starling. Have you seen a European starling? You might be looking at the picture saying, Raya, that looks like an exotic bird. It's got like white spots all over. It's kind of almost shiny looking. Well, the European starling, even though it looks, I think it looks really cool, actually. People don't notice them so much. They're everywhere. I bet every single one of you has seen a European starling before, even if you haven't really noticed those details. They're not here from here again. They're from another country. So they're a non-native species. Um, they're from Europe, essentially. Their sound, the first time I heard it, oh my gosh, I was in a parking lot and I heard this sound. I just, oops, I had just parked my car and I heard the sound. And um, I looked up and there were so many of them. And I was like, sounds like, like there's a bunch of R2D2s in the parking lot with me. So I'm gonna play the sound, see if you agree with me. Maybe you don't, let's see. They have warbles and whistles and chitters. <laughs> Kind of liquidy sounds sometimes too. <laughs> um, in that moment, I was, I could have told, like, if somebody had asked me, I'd been like, yeah, there were droids all around my car this morning. But in any case, that's um, the starling sound. We usually don't see just one of them. Like in that picture, you might see a whole bunch of them, which is called a murmuration of starlings. Usually I see a bunch if I see one. Hello. Last bird before we go for a walkabout is one of the waterfowl with a winter waterfowl. And this bird, the long-tailed duck. Any guesses why it's called a long-tailed duck? A long tail. Yeah, you can see that long tail there. This is a bird who spends most of their time up high, way up high, maybe um, even as far north as the Arctic. That's their breeding space. And they come down to Toronto. You know how people in Canada often go to Florida for the winter because it's warm down there? Toronto is their version of Florida. They're like, it's so warm down here. We're going to come down here and spend our winter. So if you go down to the Toronto waterfront, you might spot some long-tailed ducks. If you don't spot them, you might hear them. It could be very distant. They kind of have a sound that sounds something like, and sometimes I hear that sound really far away. I don't see them, but I know they're there and it just fills my heart. Makes, warms my heart. So I'll play the sound here. There's a whole bunch of them in the sound. So you can actually, it sounds like they're having a big party, right? Oh, I just love it. All right. So we've talked about a whole lot of different bird species. If you want to learn more about different species, about the species we've talked about, learn more details, or um, learn about other species, there's a really great website called allaboutbirds.org. And the link will go in the chat in a moment. Um, and this, is, this website is put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in the States. So ornithology is the study of birds. And it's, uh, this is a kind of bird institution at, in a university. So um, allaboutbirds.org, I use it all the time, like probably almost every day if I see a bird and I want to learn more about it, then I check that, uh, check that site out. 
I think it's time to do a little walkabout. Shall we just have a quick look at the feeder, Jasmine? See who's there right now. Pretty quiet for a moment. See if anybody's flying in to grab some seed. And, oh, there we go. Our reliable black cap chickadees. Grab a seed and go. <laughs> We've got black oil sunflower seed on that, on that feeder. All right. So for our walkabout, we are going to explore this area that we are in and have a look at some different habitats within this space. I'm going to start off. Actually, you know what, guys? I'm going to take you off of my tripod so I can walk around with you more easily. There we go. So we're going to start off um, having a look at this forest edge here. And the reason I wanted to point it out is because if we imagine this, just this edge bit extending out all the way across, what kind of habitat would you call that? Kind of a field or maybe a meadow, right? There are a lot of meadow plants right here. And one of these meadow plants is this one. So this is called goldenrod, little kind of small slender leaves along the length of the stem and lots and lots of seeds at the top of the goldenrod. I can't let that sit focus just yet. We've already seen a bird interacting with the goldenrod in one of our pictures. So Jasmine, if you can pull that up again, we have proof that birds will eat the seed. Chickadees eating goldenrod right there. And this is one of our ecosystem interactions where we're seeing that the meadow habitat provides for birds. If we look at these other seed heads here, we can see that we've got some variety in the types of seed in this meadow. And if we have variety in the plants, that means we have variety in the birds. I'm just noticing the time. Gosh, we've been, uh, we usually try to have our live streams run about half an hour and then questions. I think this one's going to run a little longer, folks, just giving you a heads up. So um, we're going to keep going because we've just scratched the surface. As Jasmine and I were putting the live stream together, we were like, oh, I don't know if we're going to be able to keep it to 30 minutes. There's so much to share. Now, we were just looking at a meadow habitat. And as we're moving down here, we're seeing a lot more trees, some shrubbery. So we're kind of getting into a forest habitat here, right? And you're seeing there are lots of spots where um, there are branches. And I've seen in the city too, if there are lots of dead branches in the corner of somebody's yard, that's great shelter for birds. So you'll see more birds there. There are some birds that also eat the seeds of different trees. And um, one of them is the American goldfinch, and they love to eat seeds from alders and other trees. So here's an example of an alder, which is, it's a tree that's kind of like a birch tree. So the American goldfinch will mow down on those seeds. And the cedar waxwing is a bird that loves to eat berries from shrubs. And so um, if we've got different, a diversity of shrubs with different berries on them, then you're gonna maybe invite cedar waxwings to your space. And I think we have a video. This is another one of those videos that I took the other day when I was out of a house sparrow. It's a female house sparrow. Um, and this one is has found some food in somebody's yard. So a lot of people like to plant bird-friendly plants. This is a great thing you can do to help birds by planting plants that produce berries or seeds that birds will benefit from and eat. That bird is having a trouble breaking that seed apart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this forest that we're in here, there's a patch of beautiful dogwood here. We've been talking about interactions as far as birds eating from their habitats or the ecosystems they're a part of, but shelter is really important as well. And so this plant, dogwood, you can see the red stems. There are some birds, whenever I see dogwood, I always think of the yellow warbler who really loves to make nests in dogwood. You can see those red stems there. So that's a spring picture. These are birds, yellow warblers migrate south and they come back in the spring, but look at that yellow warbler nesting right in that dogwood. So many important aspects of uh, habitats and ecosystems for birds. Now, we're gonna carry on and I wanna show you one more habitat because it's kind of indicative of where we are as well. I can share where we are for some students or teachers who might've been here in the past. What habitat do you think this is? You're like, Raya, it's a soccer field. Actually, no, it's a lake. This is a lake, but it's frozen, so it looks like a field. So this is a huge lake that's frozen. 
snow on it. Um, and if it was um, open water, like in Lake Ontario, there are spots that have open water, then you would find um, winter waterfowl in that open water. They're either diving down or they're dabbling looking for food. And I'm not going to go into too much about winter waterfowl today because that's, like I said, there's so much to share. But if you wanted to learn more, um, TRCA, we did recently post a video about winter waterfowl. And I'll put the link to the video in our chat. It's about a five, six, maybe seven minute video about some different winter waterfowl species you can find in the GTA. Super cool. So if we think about this habitat, well, our chickadees, they're not going to really find what they need in this habitat. They're not part of a lake ecosystem. Um, and the woodpeckers, they're more of a forest bird, right? So we're noticing that different habitats provide different things. And, um, and that's something to keep in mind as you're looking for birds. Just because they're right here, check this out. A deer has walked across the edge of this lake here. And this deer was, a I wouldn't say they were lazy, but they weren't picking up their feet all the way. So their toes were dragging between prints, between tracks. Kind of funny. There's also some little tiny tracks underneath this log here. You can see the frozen ice. So cool. I know this one isn't, a, this live stream is not about animal tracks, Raya. That's the next one, but I couldn't resist showing you. All right. So we've talked about some different habitats. We've learned about different bird species. We've talked about some interactions between birds and the space that they're in or the habit ecosystem they're a part of. I wanted to share, if you really, if you get into birding, something that all birders should know is about birding etiquette. So etiquette is kind of like the proper way to do things. And when we think about birding etiquette, if people follow proper birding etiquette, it's actually really good for the birds. There's something called ethical birding, which means you don't do things that harm the birds. So you don't um, go too close to them. Now, chickadees, they're pretty brazen. We've seen they're coming in and out. There are a lot of birds that are actually not, not really comfortable with the proximity that a lot of people take. So people getting too close. They can see humans as a threat, much like predators in their ecosystems. And, um, you know, they, it stresses them out, basically. <laughs> And um, other things you shouldn't do are go too close to their nests, right? Kind of leave them be, don't stress them out. You shouldn't, so you shouldn't do playback. What I was doing earlier, I was trying to keep it as quiet as I could externally, but still wanting to share the sounds with you. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, if playback is too loud, then it can actually confuse the birds. So when I'm birding, if I want to hear a bird sound, I usually have headphones so the birds can't hear it. And all those things are really important to not stress the bird out. You also don't want to um, go off the trail, especially in Toronto. So if you're in a wild space, there aren't very many, very many people. It doesn't impact the habitat as much. But in Toronto, in our green spaces, there are so many people that visit these spaces. Thankfully, I encourage you to. But it's even more important to stay on the trail. Because if you're going off trail, then you're potentially destroying the habitat without realizing it. One person goes off trail and everybody starts going off trail, right? So these are all important things to keep in mind. Um, following good birding etiquette, doing ethical birding is really, it's, it means you're not stressing the birds out and it means that you are not damaging the habitat as much as, as people do if they're not doing ethical birding. So I wanted to mention those things to you. Now I have a few more things to show and I'm just walking back to the feeder so I'm having a look. I think I'm going to jump right into sharing these, these things with you here. We've talked about bird interactions with ecosystems based on what they're eating. We touched upon the shelter piece but I wanted to get into that a little bit more. So we're going to pan up boop, into this tree. See if I can get a good angle for you. you. See right there that there is a hole in the tree, a tree cavity. This tree cavity is a really cool interaction. So the pileated woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker is a woodpecker who is pretty big compared to the other ones. Woody woodpecker <laughs> was actually uh, modeled after the pileated woodpecker. <laughs> and they will peck, peck, peck looking for insects, looking for food. So there's one interaction. And as they then create this hole, that is a pretty sizable hole, 
other animals might use that hole. We call it a cavity. So there are a lot of cavity nesters who, for their shelter, when they're raising young, they are looking for cavities to lay their eggs in, including pileated woodpeckers. Now, what's interesting is the pileated has then adapted to, uh, <laughs> sorry, a chickadee just flew by my, my phone here. Um, so the pileated woodpecker has adapted um, to behave this way. So they have a really sharp beak and they have a, um, a really like solid skull at the back of their skull. So when they're pecking, then their brain doesn't uh, jostle around in their skull. And they have really good feet for gripping the tree, specially designed feet with two toes in the front, two in the back, so they can grip onto that tree. And all these adaptations give the woodpecker a, a particular kind of ecological niche, you can say, like it fits in a, it occupies this particular ecological niche in an ecosystem. Um, and there is no other bird that, that does that. So when we start thinking about roles that animals, that wildlife play in ecosystems, um, we can start thinking about the niche that is specific to that particular species or organism. So we shared the tree cavities the woodpeckers make. I have a couple of other examples of uh, materials that birds might use. So I have a couple of nests to show you. This is a nest that was found a couple of years ago and collected. And then you've got this one as well. And you notice they're quite different. So different birds use different materials to make their nest This and make them in different shapes. This is a cup nest. And you can see it's kind of in the shape of a cup. So the warbler we showed earlier, the yellow warbler, they make a cup nest. What do you see here? We don't just see twine and um, or like grasses and things. We also see mud, right? So robins, sometimes they don't use the mud, but sometimes they'll use mud to make sort of a base layer for their nest. So having different plants in a habitat allows for more diversity again, more biodiversity in the bird species. Now let's compare, <laughs> look at this tiny, tiny nest. Oh my goodness. What type of bird do you think occupied or built, built this tiny nest here? And you can see that this bird has used lichen to line their nest. They actually use spider webbing to make the inside nice and stretchy and then lichen to make the outside camouflaged, right? So this was a hummingbird. A hummingbird made that tiny, tiny little cup nest. So there's another piece of interaction there for us to be aware of. We've got birds needing food from their habitat and birds needing materials and spaces for shelter. There we go. All right. Oh. I'm going to pass the feeder and Jasmine, if you can show the feeder, I think we've got a bird. I wonder if people can remember who it is. Not the chickadees folks, the other one. I'll be passing the scope in a sec. Sorry guys. So do you remember who that other bird, if they flew off now, who that bird was? And that was the white breasted nuthatch. Now, if you're thinking, oh, this is cool. I've actually learned some things I didn't used to know. Then um, I encourage you. I'm just trying to put my phone back on the tripod. So that's why I'm kind of distracted. One sec. There we go. All right. Back in action. So I encourage you um, to think, okay, you want to get into birding. And maybe you're thinking about what can I do to help the birds? Well, we've learned like planting native plant species. Great for helping birds have what they need in a habitat, in a space, um, especially in the city where there's a lot of things that we have for humans that birds really don't need and don't want. Um, planting native plants, keeping cats indoors. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but outdoor cats are actually really detrimental to bird populations. And um, putting dots on windows. So birds will fly into a window because they don't see the window, they see a reflection. Maybe they think, oh, there's another bird over there. Or they see the reflection of a tree and they're gonna fly to that branch, the window. So if you put dots on the windows really close together, the birds see the window and they won't fly through. But going out birding and actually contributing to the scientific knowledge all around the world of different bird species is a great thing you can do. eBird is an, um, a way to, it's a worldwide database where you can enter in the birds you've seen. If you see a bird out the window, you can go to eBird. There's no, it's free. There's no, uh, no payment there. You go to eBird and say, on this date, I saw this bird in this part of Toronto or this part of Markham or this part of Brampton. And, um, the database, all this information that people contribute around the world, lets 
scientists understand over the years, like what's happening to bird populations in different spaces. It's great. There is actually an upcoming um, birding event, the Great Backyard Bird Count. February 18th to the 21st. There's a link that's going in the chat in just a moment where you can, during those four days, anytime, take 15 minutes, check out some birds, and then you can go into eBird and document them. And it, every year this happens, so we get a snapshot of around the same time of year every year, what's happening with these bird populations. It's a big push to get that snapshot picture of what's going on. Um, I also encourage you, in the, if you or if you're thinking maybe I won't do that, but I do want to check out some birds now. Um, there is a bird tally sheet on the second page of the worksheet, or you can just make your own. And on that bird tally sheet, if you go out in the next couple of days and notice some birds, you can get in the habit of like just documenting, writing them down, so you start noticing them more. You put the date, the name of the bird, how many you saw, any notes, was it male or female, was it on the ground, in the trees, drinking from a puddle. <laughs> Um, and then if you want to submit that to eBird, you have that information right there in front of you. I really encourage you to, to do a little bird tally in the next couple of days. Just, just make some notes, notice some birds around you. So I've been sharing a lot of information with you. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for all your attention. We're going to take some questions now, but if you do need to go, because we went a little over our normal time, if you do need to go, it's been wonderful having you today. And I really encourage you to get out, like I said, get out birding, just get out enjoying nature, listening. And, um, and uh, just so you are aware, for teachers to spread the word in on our next live stream, February 16th, is for kindergarten classes about animal signs and facts. So um, we'll, we'll uh, hope to see some of your younger siblings, students then, or kindergarten teachers, grade one, grade two as well, are welcome to join um, for our kinder tax live stream. But Jasmine, are there any questions in the chat? <laughs> Yes, that was amazing, Raya. Thank you for sharing all of that information. And we do have some questions that have come in uh, throughout the live stream. One question I wanted to ask you, and I actually think we might have a video that shows this really well, is how do birds use their feathers to stay warm in the winter? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. So yeah, Jasmine, if you're able to pull up that video, you can demonstrate what I'll be talking about. Um, so birds... What, what do you do in the winter, right? You put on a coat, you're trying to increase the insulation between you and the cold air around you. So birds are trying to do the same thing, but rather than put on a coat, they try to make their, their feather layer thicker. So they'll puff out their feathers, create more airspace in that feather layer because the airspace can also hold the warmth of their bodies. So by puffing out the feathers, um, they're basically keeping themselves warmer. And if you see this, like the same bird, on a warm day, will look all slender. And then on a cold day, <laughs> you'll see the same bird looking like they're wearing a really puffy jacket. It's kind of funny. Good question. Awesome. OK, we have another question that just came in. And that question is, where are some of the best places or parks to go bird watching around the GTA? I love it. Um, so the first one that comes to my mind, and I feel like I'm a little low on my screen here. I'm just going to raise the there we go. I think that's better. So the first one that comes to my mind is a park that I spent a lot of time at. Now, I didn't mention right now I'm at a place called Lake St. George, which is a, skill, a field center for schools. Um, it's not open to the public. It's a lovely spot, but not open to the public. Just south of here, there are some forest tracts, um, like between Stovall Road and Bethesda. There are some spaces that people go walking in York region. Uh, but the park I often work at is called Tommy Thompson Park, also known as the Leslie Street Spit. Um, and it's a peninsula that goes five kilometers into Lake Ontario. And it is actually um, a world renowned. It's called an IBA, designated by Birds International, Bird Life International. Um, IBA means important bird area. So in that park alone, around the year, there have been documented, I think it's 320 something bird species. And in the winter, that's where like, it's a hotspot for winter waterfowl. So if you're in Toronto, that's a great place to go. Um, Sam Smith Park in the West End is fantastic as well. Oh gosh, what's the name of that one? It's more towards Scarborough. Oh, I can't remember the name of it, it's on the shoreline. But, <laughs> um, and I'm not as familiar. So Rat Tray Marsh in Mississauga is a good one. And in York Region, um, yeah, if you were to look up like York Region, green space, that kind of thing, then any of the York Region forests, and there are quite a number of them, um, I would think that those are great for birds as well, although I haven't myself walked around too much in the York Region forests. 
But if you were to go to Birds Canada um, and or just type in Birding Hotspots Toronto, then these GTA ones should show up. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a like good I said, question. Videos, I just, in my neighborhood, I went walking around and I see white-breasted nuthatches and I see goldfinches and sparrows. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. But those sound like some great spots to check out. Um, we have another question that has come in. And this question might be a little tricky. It's a, a big question. This question is, how many species of woodpeckers are there? So I happen to know that there are 238 species of woodpeckers that have been recognized worldwide. But Ryan, maybe you can talk about some of the different species of woodpeckers that we can see here in the GTA. Absolutely. So we talked about, and you can probably list some of these now that we've seen, right? So the hairy and the downy are the, the ones I see most in Toronto. Um, the red-bellied woodpecker is one that I see in Toronto maybe next most. I see the pileated more in really nicely forested areas. Um, so probably like more Mississauga, Brampton, Markham, York, um, Thornhill. That's where I might see more pileated than right in the uh, kind of more concrete jungle of Toronto. Um, the red-headed woodpecker is, oh, sorry, there, are they going to the theater? There was a woodpecker that just, a downy, I think. They have this flight pattern where they, they go flap, 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 swoop, flap, 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 swoop. So if you see like a swooping, then it, yeah, they're not going to the theater. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I get really excited when I see a bird that I haven't spotted yet that day. Uh, right, so the red-headed woodpecker, um, I don't see them very often at all, but they're around here and there. Totally redhead. Oh, I feel like I'm missing some main what major ones. Oh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. If you see little tiny holes in a tree all in a line or in a grid, um, or just in a line across, that's made by the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is a woodpecker. And I think those are the those are the main ones coming to mind right now. I might be missing one or two GTA woodpeckers, but yeah. That's amazing. So many different types of woodpeckers. So exciting. So this is a question that has come in from a few different people. Sounds like a lot of people want to know, Raya, what is your favorite bird? <laughs> oh, there are so many birds that I love for certain, for different reasons. Like the long-tailed duck, I love their call. It makes me so happy to hear. And the junco, I love seeing it because it's a, such a charming bird that I'm like, you're here for the winter, like it's cold, but you're doing it. Um, you know, I think my favorite bird, I've said this before, and I'm going to stick to it, is actually a bird that we don't see here. It's called a killdeer. I don't like the name, but <laughs> um, they're a little, they're, I don't know, they're about the size of a robin, maybe a little bigger than a robin. They have long legs, um, and they're often by shorelines, or they're also on agricultural fields, and they make a sound that they, they just sound so anxious, and I just feel for them. Their sound to me sounds like they're going, Check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out. Somebody thought they were saying, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer. And that's why they got that name. But just the pitch of their, their call, um, it kind of, it's endearing to me. Check it out, check it out. And I have a soft spot for the kill deer. They have a little black necklace too, but not a winter bird. You'll see them more in the summer. Awesome. Okay. We have another question that came in and um, they're wanting to know, do you often see any different types of hawks? Um, and this person sees a few in East York. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually, that's, I live in East York as well. And so the most common hawk that I will see is the red-tailed hawk. That's kind of my default. If I see a hawk and I don't know who it, who it is, I'm like, oh, it's probably a red-tail. Um, but definitely if you see a hawk flying and from underneath, you can see the tail fanning out with some red on it. And then it's a red-tailed hawk. I believe hawks are in their own order, actually, come to think of it. Um, which, you know, it's really nice and unique about them. So Cooper's hawks is another one that people sometimes confuse with the red-tailed hawk when you're seeing them perched. Um, in, so for those who are really loving hawks, just so you know, fall is great. It's a great season to see the hawks. So, oh, Rosetta McLean, that was the park <laughs> towards Scarborough along the shoreline that I was forgetting earlier. Um, I know people sometimes do hawk watch out of uh, Rosetta McLean and High Park. They'll watch for hawks overhead. Um, and fall is a great time to do that. So red tail, Cooper's hawk. There's the, 
Oh, Jasmine, help me out. I'm gapping on my hawk knowledge right now. There's a rough-legged hawk, I think, um, who I've seen once. <laughs> there are... Uh, there are sharp-shinned hawks as well. I don't know if you mentioned that. Oh, them. yeah, sharp-shinned. They're little tiny guys. Shinnies, people call them in the birding world. It's not shinny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, maybe we won't take too many more, but just a few more. Um, one question is asking, Mariah, this is a big question again, but um, how cold can it get well, while birds are still able to survive? Can birds survive throughout the winter, even when it gets down to negative 15, negative 20 here in, in the GTA? That's a really good question. Um, it depends on the bird species. Now, negative 15, negative 20 is probably okay for the birds we're seeing down here. But like the typical winter birds, like the ones I've mentioned and so forth, they have their strategies to keep warm. Water birds, they actually, like imagine in water, that's four degrees Celsius. They have a really cool circulatory system in their legs that keeps their legs from freezing. The warm blood that's coming down the leg heats up the cold blood that's going up. So there are all these different strategies for staying warm. Um, the, there are some birds that if we had a, a massively cold snap, maybe they that got down to like negative 40 or something, which I <laughs> knock on wood, that's not going to happen um, around here. So I, I imagine that there are some birds that couldn't take that. But for the most part, the birds that are here in the winter have adapted to these temperatures going down to minus 15, minus 20. It's not easy for them. And food helps them put on fat, which helps them stay warm and gives them energy to survive um, the winter. So planting plants that provide the food for the birds is really great. Um, feeders are fine, but usually you really want to have the habitat be good for them rather than relying on bird food that we put out. So the birds that we see here, yeah, they've adapted to these kinds of cold temperatures, I think better than some people have. <laughs> as long as you dress warm, you're fine. But uh, some, a lot of people, um, have to kind of figure out how to dress warm for themselves to enjoy time outside and birds have it figured out. Definitely, yeah, that's a great answer. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you another question here. Um, and I think this is a question that we kind of answered throughout the live stream. Um, we're wanting to know what are some of the most common birds that we can see across the GTA? Yeah, so I mean, if I was to say, so winter, we're talking about, I think, if I was to say five most common, some of these aren't only winter birds, but we mentioned house sparrow earlier. We saw the European starling. Um, the the black checked cap chickadees are tricky because they um, we see them in Toronto, but with all the noise pollution in the city, we're seeing fewer in the city itself. And they're but if you're in um, in York or Durham or Brent or Peel, then you're probably seeing more black cap chickadees. I don't know if you just heard there was a red squirrel yelling at me. Um, Blue jays, mm, we saw a couple this morning. They usually fly south for the winter, but there are some that stick around. So they're a common bird, maybe not as common in the winter. Oh, rock doves, what am I thinking? Rock doves, people usually call them pigeons, right? So rock doves are a very common urban bird. And and yeah, finches, like house finches, uh, gold finches. I'd kind of say finches as in general, that group of birds would be a sort of common group in the winter. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Um, we have another question that came in. What time of year is best for bird watching? It depends who you want to see. In the summer, you're not going to see a lot, some of the birds that we talked about today. You won't see long-tailed ducks. You won't see um, the American tree sparrows. And in the, so in Toronto, we're actually on a, or in the GTA, I should say, we're on a bird flyway. So when they're migrating, they fly through this area. Some of them stop and nest in the GTA, but a lot of them keep flying north. So in the summer, we don't get to see those ones that fly north to the boreal forest. So the best time of year to see the most variety would be in the spring and in the fall. In the spring, they usually have their fancy feather outfits on. So they're like, hey, we want to make friends. In the fall, they might look a little more drab, some of these birds. They might not be able to tell them apart as well. Um, so the spring is really great if you want to see a big variety and be able to tell the differences easily. Um, any time of year you can see birds, but if you want to see the most variety, then yes, like May. There's actually a Toronto bird celebration that happens every year in May. Um, lots of birding events and uh, now they're online, but um, really great chance to learn about different bird species in the GTA. 
who fly through her nest here. Awesome. Okay, I think we're gonna close off with one last question, Raya. And that question is just for you. This question is, what is the prettiest bird in your opinion? It's a hard one. <laughs> The prettiest bird is the one I'm looking at in that moment. Oh my goodness. I, when I look at a bird, I just, there, there's so much charm in their behavior that lends to how I view them, which means that I feel like they're beautiful because of how they are and um, kind of what they put off with from us, right? <laughs> As humans and our impact. Um, yeah, I know that's not the answer you're looking for. The prettiest bird, though, is the one that I see right in front of me in any given moment. Definitely. That makes sense. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, so much for, for tuning in with us. Rai, if you want to say a few words before we sign yeah. off. As Jasmine said, thank you. It's been a, such a great pleasure having you and sticking around. For those that stuck it out to the end, you're troopers because I could go on and on and on about birds. <laughs> um, and like I said, I encourage you to get out, get that bird tally sheet or make your own and go notice some birds outside, whether it's through your window or go on a neighborhood walk. And um, if, like I mentioned this earlier, if there are kindergarten teachers that you can share this with, we have a live stream coming up February 16th called Kinder Tracks, Nature in Your Classroom Kinder Tracks, lots of movement in that one for kiddos. So please tune in then and have a wonderful Wednesday, my friends. Take care, everybody. Happy birding.